Well, great to have you here. My name's David. I'm one of the many uh, ministers here who serve. Uh, welcome to Gunnada Anglican. Here we here at, um, at Gunnada Anglican, we believe that God has spoken to His people, called them to make disciples and to be salt and light in the world. And that's uh, well, not that we made anything up. That's just what Jesus has called us to do. And. Uh, Simon will be speaking more about being salt and light later in the service. A welcome also to the Christmas season. You're officially, um, it's all right if you've already put up your trees, but you're officially allowed to now and to sing as many Christmas carols as you want. And we're going to sing some Christmas songs this morning, certainly. Our first one, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, uh, is, a, is a beautiful one that just uh, expresses that longing for God to come and rescue his people to come among his people as Emmanuel, as God with us. And looks forward to uh, yeah, the, some of the different ways in which Jesus heals and rescues us. So let's uh, stand and sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
this God who became one of us is the God that we uh, declare in the creed. Stay standing, please, while we join in this statement of this God that we believe in. In whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, please be seated. Well, this uh, God who has, we remember has appeared to us is the one we're going to hear from now in his word. Um, yeah, if you want to turn your Bibles to the first one, Isaiah 49. Good morning, everyone. The first reading is Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 7, and can be found on page 726. Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 7. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see you and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. The second reading is Psalm 2 on page 532. Psalm 2, page 532. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have instilled my, installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, 
lest he be angry and you will be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The third reading is Matthew chapter 5, 13 to 16, and can be found on page 958. It's Matthew chapter 5, from verse 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Well, one of the things that we're going to do this morning uh, is actually to celebrate the fact that we have um, some kids among us. And um, we want to, uh, we're going to show you some things that some of our kids get up to in a video in a moment. Um, we'll have a kid's song, slightly different from our normal weeks. But also, um, what's happening is that the kids here who are in church are going to receive a special um, gift. As to say, thank you for being part of our um, church. Um, and thank you for being um, such wonderful participators um, in our church services. So to, for, to, for, it's a surprise for you kids, but there are some adults around who've actually got some presents for you. So if those adults would like to do that now, um, that would be terrific. So find the child that you've been nominated with and hand the present out, um, and then I'll introduce the video. So all of the all of the boys and girls who are part of our church service have received some um, gifts. Now the older kids have actually received a journal, um, and we're hoping that they might actually use that journal uh, next year uh, to take sermon notes in, um, which is which makes them very grown up, don't you think? It does. That's right. Oh, did Greg get a journal? Did he? Oh, that's his normal journal. Okay, yep. All right, so we've now we've got a, a video to play um, just to sh show you some of the activities that kids have come up with, uh, have been doing in different places.
giving us everything we need for a godly life. He's the one power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge of him who called us. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. For the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Seeing Isaiah 53 6. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge of him who called us. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. God has given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge of him who called us. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. His fine power has given us everything for we got the life. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. <laughs> Awesome, isn't it? Fantastic to see all those kids up there. Um, put you adults to shame in terms of memory verses. So, can anybody remember the memory verse? No, not kids, adults. No, not you, Joanne. <laughs> all right, well, there's a test for you. Tell me on the way out. If you don't tell me, you don't get any morning tea. All right. <laughs> if the boys and girls would like to come up the front, we've got a kid song for you now. Oh, and grab an instrument on your way. There's a bag just there. Grab an instrument. You'll need an instrument for this kid's song. So all the boys and girls up the front for a kid's song. <laughs> uh, but they did receive um, their gifts or they will receive them soon. Yeah, <laughs> pretty special. We'll start with the chorus, please, Felicity. Thank you. You can play whenever you feel like it, kids. Go tell it on the mountain.
Very good. Thank you, boys and girls. Thanks for that accompaniment. You can put your instruments back in the box. On your, and um, so if you're at crash age, you can head to crash. We can rejoin um, yeah, the adults that you're with this week. Um, well, we just heard about Go Telling on the Mountain. And our, and our sermon, is, I've got a bit of competition, but that's all right. I'm used to it. But, uh, <laughs> why is she laughing? Um, we're, we're really talking about going and telling. Uh, not Well, I'll let Simon say more about that. Do keep your Bibles open at Matthew uh, chapter 5, that third reading we had this morning. Just before I begin, I hope all of the kids have got their, um, their little um, clipboard. If they haven't, um, just stick your hand up. We'll make sure they get one. Terrific. No hands. That's great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word, your word that was read to us earlier. And we thank you mostly, Lord, that that word has the power um, to change us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that... Um, by increments, you would change us and make us more like your son. Amen. So when I was at university, um, before I became a Christian, um, a bloke, a Christian bloke called David, not this David, a different David, moved into the um, room across from me uh, in the hall where I was staying. Now, I, I was happy, uh, but not for the reasons that you might think. You see, one of, the, one of my personal objectives at university was to find Christians um, and to attack their faith. Um, so to me and others, it was a great thing um, that this person was there because we had a new target. Uh, David's experience uh, of me uh, was very different from my experience of him. So a few years back, I was talking with him and he told me that he was actually scared of me. Um, and he told me that if he heard my door open, he would stay in his room because he didn't want to be confronted by me at the door again. From my point of view, however, David and some of his other Christian friends were incredibly kind and patient. I, I actually really liked being with them, uh, despite the fact that I was a bit of a jerk. Um, they were always respectful and always very generous with their time. And in fact, it was... David's kindness and the kindness of others like him that eventually won me over to begin um, a proper and earnest search for who Jesus was. You might have heard something similar. It might be your own experience. Someone as you or others you know have been won over by the love of Jesus' people um, where their patient lives, their kindness and their, or their generosity um, have helped you to seek Jesus it might be your family members, it might be friends, it might even just be an acquaintance. But their patient love um, was like a light for you and helped you um, to be drawn to Jesus. So today we're between some series. Um, we're going to do a series leading up to Christmas. And so we thought we'd just fill the gap, if you like, um, with something really good. And that is another aspect of what it means uh, to promote the gospel um, and we're doing that by looking at being beautiful light. So we're going to start with uh, um, Matthew chapter 5 and uh, being light in the world. So we all know that one of the most powerful ways to communicate God's love is to actually be love um, for people. As a people of God, we believe the gospel is good news. We know that the Holy Spirit comes to us, we know the Holy Spirit changes us, and we know the Holy Spirit is gradually making us more like Jesus in the way that he loves people. But as well as this, we ought to also recognise the distinctive love of God uh, shown in his people is like um, a beacon, like um, a light to those uh, who don't know God's love. So Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 5, you are the light for the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds 
and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, for the Jewish people, the idea that they were light in the world was well known to them. The Old Testament establishes the fact that the people of God were to be a nation that drew other people um, toward God. That's why they were called a holy nation. They were set apart uh, for that task. A nation that looked different from the other nations uh, around them in the way that they worshipped, um, in the way that they lived, and, and all their cultural practices, and even, of course, in their meals. Now, we see this, of course, in a place like Isaiah. We see an understanding of what that means. In verse 6, he says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. I mean, that's one place, but there are many places in the Old Testament that point out how the city of Jerusalem uh, and the people of that city would be a light for the nations. And that's one of the images in Isaiah 49, an image of um, people from outside being drawn uh, into the city. And the people of God realised and regarded the fact that it was an honour for them to be God's people and chosen to be light in the world. And you, when you read this prophecy in, in, in um, Isaiah 49, the scope of the prophecy is quite breathtaking because the servant who we know is Jesus, of course, brings God's scattered people uh, back into the city. Um, and then what happens is the people of the world see and join with God's regathered people. And all of them together praise God. Now, when we get to Matthew chapter 5, uh, Jesus, who's the servant mentioned in Isaiah, picks up the idea of the people of God being light in the world and transfers it to his disciples. Um, just as in Isaiah, the disciples are to be a light to the nations, a holy people, if you like, set apart from the rest of the world. Now, that doesn't mean that they are separate from them, but they have a different nature to them. And the world according to the scriptures, will be brought to its knees before God by the distinctiveness of God's people. Now, what I should point out at this point is that in Matthew 5, when you read the word you, uh, it's the plural you. Uh, we don't have a plural you in, um, in English, but the Greeks do. Uh, and we might say in English, yous, even though that's bad English, I know. Um, but we might say that because it's, it's talking about a group of people, not individuals. And that's actually really important because the light that Jesus is referring to here is not a light for as an individual. It's more like the light of a city. I don't know, you've had one of those experiences where you, know, you might be driving at night and, and you get to the top of a hill and you look out across the landscape and you see light shining in the distance. Um, and that's a city. Now, it's, you notice it's not the individual lights in the city. It's the whole of the city together that actually draws people. Uh, individuals important, but it's the whole light um, of the city that draws people out of the darkness um, toward the light. So when Jesus is talking here, he's talking about a collective light, a light on a hill, a city, if you like, full of the individual lights, but casting light um, out around it and drawing people in um, from the darkness. Now, what is it in Matthew 5 that brings people to praise God? It is the light of God's collective people shining in the world and bringing people in. Around about 300 years after the words, those words came out of Jesus' mouth, uh, the good deeds of the Christian community, despite the active persecution of the Roman Empire, eventually conquered that empire. The deeds of God's people stood out as people who were eager to do what nobody else in the community would do because they had a completely different understanding of what it means to be a human. This won the hearts and minds of the empire and eventually, of course, spread throughout the world. Now, we mustn't underestimate the significance of this period because a lot of the ideas that we have, that's too early 
that slide, yep. A lot of the ideas that we have um, today actually come from the change that was brought by Christians back then. So what we regard as a good world, as a just world, um, all of these, I these ideas were birthed back, birthed back in a world that thought very differently about these things. Things like justice, uh, sickness, uh, slavery, what it meant to be a child, a male and female. The world we know now was very different from the world back then. And what happened was, well, God's people, understanding who they were called to be, shone as a light in the world and offered a radical new vision of what it meant to be a human being. And the behaviour of the Christian community back then um, was so significant that this is what the Emperor Julian wrote. He was the one after Constantine in about the 360s, um, and he was an anti-Christian. He was fearful, and he wrote this, that Rome would be conquered by the good deeds of Christian people. And he was right. In fact, the world was so thoroughly conquered by the lives and the attitudes of Christian people back then that we today swim in the water um, of a worldview that conquered an empire. You think that what is good now was good back then? That's not the case. So then, should it be a surprise to us that Jesus calls on his people to be a light on a hill and that that light should come from God's community of gathered people living Christ's love in the world? Should it be a surprise to us that Christ calls his people as a community to be this light on a hill? Should it be a surprise to us then that when the world is abandoning God, we see the darkness creeping in, but perhaps... No, definitely one light left is a light on a hill, the Christian community that has been changed and shaped by the good news of Jesus and what it means for us. Now, in talking about the light on a hill, we also need to talk about the light in our heart. So in, in Gunnedah Anglican Church, we take God's word seriously. I hope you do. That's why when we state our vision and mission, we state it like this, that we believe that God has spoken to people, to his people, and he has called them to make disciples and to be salt and light in the world. I mean, we believe, don't we, that it is our call to be a community of light in this community, a light uh, that starts ultimately in the heart of each one of us. Let me read from 1 Peter chapter 3. So wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewellery or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So just leave aside the words about submission and the clothes and stuff for a moment. That's not important. That's for another day. Um, but what does the rest of the passage say? Well, basically it says it's possible for us to win someone to Christ by living a distinctive Christian life. Uh, the stories I'm about to read um, are true stories. There's four of them. Uh, three of them, the names have been changed, but one, one hasn't. So Anne, Anne was moved by God's love at eight years old. It's not Anne here. Okay. It might be true of Anne, but it's not today. Uh, she told her parents, who were atheists, and they were not impressed. But over the next few decades, both Anne's parents came to trust Jesus. Why? Because they were impressed by the change in Anne, by her kindness and by the gentle prayers and the quality Christian community that she was part of. And Mike thought that churches were full of geriatric moralizers and morally deviant hypocrites. When he was invited to church, he went because he was bored. When he arrived, 
He encountered Jesus in the people of the church and it caused him to think again. He was pleasantly surprised to find that the humble lives of these genuine servants of God disturbed his prejudice and he became a follower of Jesus. Now, John used to mark up in scripture at school, but he was moved by the kindness of his teacher and the offer of ice cream and lollies <laughs> to attend a youth group that she was organising. In the home of this lady, he met the real person, not the lady who stood up in front of a class teaching scripture, but the real person. And challenged by her genuine kindness, he put his trust in Jesus. His surname is Dixon, John Dixon, many of you will know. Or after a horrific sporting accident, Iona met a radiant Christian couple who walked and breathed Jesus in their life. The light in their heart as she recovered from her injury set her back on her feet and set her on a path to rediscover the Jesus that she had lost as a child. There's two problems with these stories. And I think sometimes we balk at listening to stories like this for these two reasons. You see, sometimes it sounds like when we're talking like this about living a good life, that in hearing stories like this, people might think that what we're trying to do is to encourage you to be a good person and therefore you will earn God's salvation. It doesn't take much work, however, to know that that is actually not true from the two passages that we had read for us today. You see, for nowhere in the scriptures are people encouraged to see that good deeds will save you. It doesn't mean, however, that good deeds are not important or not part of the Christian life. Indeed, they are. In fact, if we understand the good news of Jesus properly, then we know that good deeds are actually the result of, not the cause of, someone's faith. They are a demonstration that someone has been reborn, not the means of their new birth. The means of birth is God. And good deeds flow out of a heart that has been transformed by God. Now, under God's good plan, these deeds are often the means that attract people to a hearing of the gospel message. And this is where the other problem comes in. You see, because it, to some people it appears that what we might also be doing is encouraging in Christians a, self, um, a, a false sense of security. Some people think that uh, just living a good life is enough and that means we're relieved from the responsibility of actually using words in sharing the gospel with people. Uh, you might have heard the famous quote attributed to St Francis of Assisi, which says, preach the gospel and sometimes use words. It's not true. You know that, don't you? In neither of the passages that were read here today um, is it assumed that you can simply share the gospel without words. Indeed, words are assumed. How, does a, how do a husband and wife relate to each other? How does a wife relate to her husband in gentleness and submission, if not by actions, but also by her words? How are we to be light in the world, if not just by our actions, but also by our words? So two things are assumed in these passages, and that is that words are assumed, but also a gentle, patient, loving and gracious life is also assumed. They go together. Words are essential. God spoke to us in words. We speak to others with words. And their words have the power to offer life. Well, we've been looking at this idea today of beautiful light. Beautiful light begins, I believe, with a call from God um, and for Jesus, for his community of people to be a beacon, a light on a hill. 
The good deeds of the Christian community are to be a light that draws people into the gospel and into a hearing of the good news. The light doesn't stop there because the light must also be within the individual hearts of men and women who are God's people. Now, it's both of those things that can attract people as beautiful light um, to our Lord Jesus Christ. So now I've got some questions that I want to finish with just for you to reflect on today. The first question is, how important is your godly character to you? What might other people see in your life as a blockage to beautiful life? And are you confessing it? Are you repenting of it? Are you walking away from it? So that not only as an individual, but as a community of God's people, we might be beautiful light in the world. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for your words again. Use them to change us, to make us beautiful light for the sake of your kingdom that others might know you and be drawn to you through us. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Simon. They're good uh, questions to think about. Um, uh, and do something about as well, yeah, um, yeah, that, that we become more kind um, and beautiful in the way that we live, um, as, as we heard. We're going to sing about this God who came in his kindness to show his uh, love to us in this uh, next song, which is again a anticipation, expressing a longing for Jesus to send his Saviour. Come thou long expected Jesus. So please stand and join, join with us. Please have a seat. We're going to have a time of prayer now. So invite Samson, Samson up to lead us in that. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for Emmanuel. Thank you that God was with us. He dwelt amongst us and he came to rescue us. 
Father, we come to you with our needs. Grant us the strength to fight the good fight with all our strength, with all our might. Help us to find in your son the source of strength. Guide us to run with perseverance the race that's marked for us. Help us to not doubt in your goodness. Help us to fix our eyes, to seek your face. Help us to follow Christ and let Christ be the prize of our journey. Help us to cast aside all our worries and lean on your providence. Help us to lean on you and may we find the depth of Christ's life and love, uh, our fulfillment and joy. Lord, in moments of faintness and fear, remind us that your arm is near. Assure our hearts that we are dear to you and and that, you're, that you will always remain constant. Father, instill in us the belief that Christ is enough. Uh, help us to find that you are sufficient. Father, be glorified in all the work uh, that we did at the Friday night's carols. Thank you for showing us that you are sovereign over the weather. Let the message that Jesus brings peace to all who obey him bring hope to those who have been rejecting your son. We pray for those seeking healing and comfort. Thank you, Lord, for giving Hayden Colson a very successful surgery. We pray for a speedy recovery. Father, we pray for those getting close to having their babies, Ash and David, Suzette and James, and Trish and Blake. We pray for every grace uh, in this hour. We pray for those seeking restoration in their relationships. Father, we pray that you will give them the grace to forgive and to understand each other. We pray for hope and peace for those seeking refuge in Israel and the Palestinian conflict. And Father, we pray that your word will continue to spread. Father, we pray for all those um, serving you in different areas uh, in the mission fields. We pray that you will comfort them and supply them with all their needs. Uh, we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. So we're going to share in the Lord's uh, Supper in a few minutes. And of course the Lord's Supper is open to uh, anyone who has their um, faith in the Lord Jesus as their saviour, um, as we spoke about before. Um, if you're sharing with us, um, let me just sh um, show you what will happen in a moment. Um, I'll take the cover off these uh, here. On one side uh, is grape juice, on the other side is wine. I think I've got that right. I'll take it off now. <coughs> so on that side is wine, on this side is grape juice, and that goes for the, the tray that's up the back as well. So there's gluten-free option uh, in the middle. You'll receive normal bread um, at the rail. And while you're sitting in the pew, um, perhaps you might consider praying uh, for other people while you're waiting. So hear what the Apostle Paul says. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break. Is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, and all of us share in the one bread. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These promises, however, come with a warning. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. So each one of us should examine themselves, and in this way they should eat the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognising the body eats and drinks judgement on themselves. You might like to pause...
and see if you are right with your brothers and sisters, with your family, with your friends. And considering the knowledge we have of our sin and the free gift of salvation, come humbly and confess. Let's join together. Gracious Lord, we are not worthy to eat the crumbs under your table, but your love compels us to draw near. We come with repentance and faith to express our need for all the benefits of your son's death for us. Renew us in your service and help us to love one another as members of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance. For God so loved the world, sorry, sorry, God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks to you, his almighty father, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the removal of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we'll start um, at this side, down the front, move to the back, move across and then up to the front. Thanks. I'll get you to join me with me in this prayer. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the way to heaven. May we who have remembered his death also live his risen life. We who have shared in this cup also share our faith and life with others. And we whom the spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us secure in this great hope so that we will be unashamed in living for you and so that others will come to know and praise you as we do. Amen. A few bits of church news. Uh, first up, um, aged care services are on this week. There's a few here who, who come out and help with those sometimes, which is a great encouragement to those in, in, in the aged care uh, facilities here. So that's on this week, uh, Tuesday. Yeah, and we all dance like that too. It's a cool picture, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, so that's on um, Tuesday and Wednesday. The, uh, this week, God willing, we will have another one as well, a bit closer to Christmas. Um, another excuse to sing more carols. Uh, also, speaking of Christmas, just you know, I know it's a few weeks yet, but it is Advent now. Um, just be aware on Christmas Eve, which is a Sunday, there'll be an 8 a.m. service and then a 6 p.m. service. You're welcome to come at 10 o'clock and sit and enjoy the shade under the trees, but there won't be anyone here. I won't be. Um, yeah. And I think um, Simon will be out at Mullally at 10am 10, 10 on Christmas Eve uh, as well. And then on Christmas Day, it's not at 8 or 10, it's in the middle at 9 o'clock as well. And we'll put a banner up the front as, um, of the building. In fact, if you're willing to help put up a banner, let me know afterwards um, so that everyone who passes by knows also. Um, and, and then kind of from Christmas Day through till late January, we have one service a week at 9am until the Summerfest service, which is um, the second last Sunday in January. But don't worry, we'll let you know about that more. And God willing, next week we have some flyers about Summerfest as well, which is on in the second half of January. Um, and thank you also to everyone. So I meant to bring photos, but then I thought I'd put them on the USB, but I hadn't. But it wasn't that dark at Carol's, all right? We did, in fact, it was really good. It was a great um, 
So, and thank you to those who are praying that the rain would hold off. God answered your prayers. Um, yeah, the, as Samson mentioned in his prayers, um, yeah, we have the message that out of the pieces of this world, Jesus brings peace. Yeah, and we handed out over, um, oh, well, roughly, uh, you know, it was at least 100 invites to Christmas services at one of the ministers' fraternal churches. And, um, yeah, look, there was a, roughly, you know, 1,200 people there. That's kind of 10% of our shire. Uh, so that's, that's encouraging as well. And I'm so encouraged by everyone who helped in different ways, uh, whether up the front or with music, uh, helping to set up, um, helping to cater, you know, helping to, fa- to paint faces, uh, to clean up afterwards as well. Um, and, yeah, it was so encouraging to see people serving in lots of different ways. And I think that's a real witness as well to the people from the Shire who come and help. I think they're just amazed by just how it all comes together as well. Uh, are you making faces at me, Simon? Oh, you're making faces at Wesley. Right. <laughs> I'm not as scared of you as the other David, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, that was distracting. Right. Let's get back into seeing a real... Christmas Carol, the first Noel. Let's remember what the season's about. Please stand. chapter 3 verse 3 says at one time we too were foolish disobedient deceived and enslaved we lived in malice and envy envy hated and hating one another but when the kindness and love of God 
Our Saviour appeared. He saved us. Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. Uh, we've been reminded of these truths in, in this service, of God's kindness in coming at Christmas, of coming to die for us, as we remember in the Lord's Supper, and his kindness that we are called to share as well with others as we live as lights in our world. Let's go out and do that this week, starting with a cuppa, and share that kindness with someone else.